Wow, thank you. Kind of an emotional song. Thank you guys for sharing that. That's a, that's a sweet, sweet message. We're so blessed, aren't we, to uh, have these folks that can come and share. And, and I'm so thankful for a church where you get to share your gifts and, uh, and glory to the Lord. So uh, Gary and Carol, thank you so much for that uh, message. Um, everything you do has an impact on somebody, doesn't it? And that song just kind of reminds us of that. So uh, beautiful. I'm going to ask if you'll join me for a word of prayer this morning. Uh, glad you're here. Glad you're here to worship. Uh, but I want us just to now focus, if we can, on what God wants to say to us in our hearts uh, this morning through his word. So would you just join me with a, uh, a time of just prayer and seeking him and, and asking him to speak to us. So pray with me. Father, thank you um, for this opportunity. So blessed, Lord, with this opportunity to gather in this place and to worship you. God, thank you this morning for just the time of worship, just God's simple songs, great old hymns of faith that we know. God, there's something that resonates deep in us from that. Maybe it takes us back to simpler times. I I, I don't know. God, this morning, our hearts well up with praise to you and who you are and how you work and how you move and Lord, we magnify and glorify your name in this place this morning. You are worthy, worthy, worthy of our worship. And God, in the same breath, we declare our need for you. God, we need you to speak to our hearts, our lives this morning. God, we need to hear from you. God, more than we need to hear from Buddy this morning or... God, for what, for what someone else says about you, God, we need to hear from you. We need you to speak. God, in this day and age in which we live, there's so many voices crying out that we could be listening to. God, we need to hear you. And I pray this morning as we open your word together that even now, Lord, you would prepare our hearts for what you want to say to us. God, make our hearts soft and pliable before you. To let your word soak in and soak through us this morning and change us. And right now we just invite your Holy Spirit, Father, to fall on us. Have your perfect way in this place today. God, your word says about itself, it doesn't return void. And and I believe that with all of my heart, God, I, I thank you for that promise. And this morning as your word goes out, Lord, I just believe, God, that you're going to plant seeds and stir her hearts and, and, and God, work, Father, as only you can. If there's one in this place that doesn't know you today, God, I, feel they would, I pray they would feel and experience the drawing of your Holy Spirit. And for believers who are struggling this morning, God, I pray that they would feel your drawing of their hearts and their lives back to you. God, would you just minister and heal and bless and save and comfort and do all of those things, God, to your glory. And God, when we come to the close of this service in a little bit and we get ready to leave this place, may we leave here saying it was good to be in the house of the Lord. It was good to hear you, Lord. Thank you for your word to us today. And may we leave changed, not just stirred, God, but changed, adapting our life to what you show us. God, we love you and we praise you. We'll give you all the praise and the glory for what you show us and what you do in us here in this place today. It's in your holy name that I ask these things. Amen. If you have your Bible with you this morning, we're going to be in a couple of passages of Scripture today. If you want to be finding, first of all, the Gospel of Mark, uh, be finding Mark's Gospel, if you would. And you may want to go just all to the very end of Mark's Gospel with me today. Um, I've I've been so taken over the last few weeks with this series that we've been in. It seems like every year around Easter, I I love preaching all of these um, kind of lead-ups to Easter. And you guys know that we've been in a series of messages um, probably for about the last five, six weeks that was just called uh, Journey to the Empty Tomb. Well, we got to the empty tomb last week, and of all things, we found it empty, right? Praise the Lord, it's empty, right? That means he is alive, and he's here today. 
But something that always strikes me is that, you know, after Easter is over, we put up all the Easter musicals and we put up all the crosses that we have hanging out. Well, we don't because ours is attached to the wall, but um, we do that. You know what I'm saying? And so the next week we move on and there almost seems like there can be this little dull if we're not careful that, you know, we've got him in the grave and we've got him risen now. Now we can go on. But what I want you to think about, and this is what God's kind of laid on my heart this week that I just, and and as we kind of go through this message this morning, I'll tell you where this kind of inspiration came from, a statement that I heard this week. But um, anyway, as we kind of move on now, I just want you to know that um, what we celebrated last week in Easter and in that empty tomb, well, that's not the end of the story. It doesn't end there. Um, It doesn't end there with us gaping into a tomb, looking at no one being there and going, now what, right? I mean, there's more to the story, if you want to notice. And if you look in your bulletin today, you'll know that I've titled this more to the story. Here's what I want to do just kind of the next couple of weeks, okay? This is what I'm kind of calling a mini series, sort of, okay? I just want to talk about the what next after the empty tomb. So here's what I've titled this little short little um, mini-series, sequel to this long series we've been in. I've just titled it Journey from the Empty Tomb, okay? Isn't that original? (laughs) You know, think about that. We've gotten to the empty tomb. Well, now what, right? What happens next? Because listen, the story doesn't end there. And, And I think the things that began to happen following that are what impacted the world. I'll even take it a step further. I think what happened following that empty tomb turned the world upside down. The world's never recovered from what happened with a risen Savior because here it is. He is alive. And for the plus 2,000 years or more that he's been alive, he is still at work. Still at work in his church. Still at work in the lives of his people. He is still moving. And I'm just going to tell you, because he's alive, he's here today. As we said last week, we're two or more gathered in his name. He's there. And that's because he's alive. So, so now, what are we to do with that? Where do we go from there. So I want to just preach this little sequel to that series we're in, probably just two, maybe three at the most messages about what happened exactly following that empty tomb. Well, now we know some of what took place, right? And um, last week, um, as I kind of shared this passage of scripture in the sunrise service, we kind of got a little bit of a picture of what happened in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. Paul told us, and just look at these words on the screen. This is what I preached from last Sunday morning early when we got here for our sunrise service. And if you just remember this, this is what happened immediately following. And it says this, Paul said, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ Jesus died for our sins according to the scripture. So the cross happened, right? And that he was buried placed in the tomb, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And then here's what happened after the resurrection. And that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. And after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. And after that, he was seen by James, his half-brother, by the way, who was not a believer until he saw him alive. That's interesting. Then by all the apostles... Then last of all, he was seen also by me, Paul, as one born out of time. But even that is not the end of the story. The the story goes on from there. And there's some very important things that happen that, listen, we must not miss. Um, As believers, these things could not be more significant. So that's what I've titled the message this morning in this first of these little kind of mini series we're going to do that I'm just kind of calling more to the story there's the ascension of Jesus. So listen, he got up from the tomb, right? And then he went up from this earth. Now, what does that mean for us? What's the significance of that? If you think about it, you don't hear too many messages preached on the ascension. I'm going to say to you that every year about this time of year, you're going to hear a message about the empty tomb. And the week before that, you're going to hear a message about the cross, right? Oh, listen, we ought to preach on the cross all the time, I believe. But, but anyway, you're going to hear those for sure. But, but following that day, listen, we kind of just go our way, kind of merrily go our way, right? We've got them alive now, and now we can move on to something else. So I want to tell you, listen, there are some significant things that we must not move on. 
Why is the ascension of Jesus so important to me? Many people say that the ascension of Jesus lives in the shadow of the crucifixion and the resurrection. And I want you to see this morning that we need to raise the ascension to understand the significance of that in light of the crucifixion and the resurrection. So we're going to begin in Mark chapter 16, the very last two verses of the very last chapter of Mark's gospel. That's where we're going to begin today. And if you're there with me in your Bible, look at the 16th chapter. Let's kind of get our heads around what's taking place here. And then I want to read just the last two verses as we kind of going to, going to be different places in scripture today. So as we kind of get started this morning. So if you've got your Bible there in front of you, let's just kind of look at chapter 16 for, for me uh, for just a second, if you've got it open there. If you look at chapter 16, this is Mark's account of the resurrection. This is, as chapter 16 opens up, this is Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the women going to the tomb and finding that it's empty, and their initial reaction to it being empty is one of shock disbelief. Where have they taken the Lord's body? Where have they hidden him? And if you read that passage of scripture, you'll discover that he's alive. He's alive. And in context of the other Gospels, you understand he actually appears to them right then at the tomb. And that's an amazing story in itself. And they couldn't wait to go tell other people. And then look at your Bible there. If you skip on down to about verses 16, uh, I mean about verse 15 and following there, Jesus actually gives to his followers a commission. This is Mark's account of the Great Commission, which we'll talk about a little bit later in this message. And then here's what happens. Look at verse 19. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, and what did he speak to them? He told them to go and tell other people that he's alive. Go tell the good news. Go tell the gospel story. So he says this, So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and set down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working through them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. That's the more to the story. You see it? And listen, I'm just going to tell you, those two verses are packed. There's some powerful things in those two verses that kind of set the tone for the more to the story. That they kind of set the tone for what happened after the resurrection. Well, he made many appearances proving that he was alive. We know he's alive. There's proof that he is alive. That that tomb is empty and that he's risen from the dead. And listen, even in this room right now, there's many that would rise up and say, I know he's alive because he lives in me. He lives in my heart, right? But what are we to do with that? What's next for you and I? It seems to me, again, that the ascension of Jesus often kind of gets overshadowed by all of the preceding things that we just get enamored with that take place. And they're all significant in their own right, of course. I mean, the cross of Christ could not be more significant for you and I, amen? I mean, we recognize that our Freedom from sin and forgiveness, our salvation was purchased in the blood of Jesus at the cross, right? And when he died on the cross, he was dying for me. He was dying for you. He was dying for the sins of the world. And we recognize the importance that he was laid in a tomb and the devil thought he'd won a victory when they sealed that tomb over. But three days later, he came back to life and we sing about it. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow, right? We sing about, we understand the significance of those two things. But, but now what does the ascension mean in light of that? What happens next and how does that impact my life? Well, now let me give you just a little bit of a, a Bible study help here this morning. Anytime you, anytime you come to a passage of scripture, whenever you're studying the Bible, there are at least three good questions you ought to always ask. Anytime you're studying the Bible, okay? Ask these three questions. First of all, what did it mean then? What did the ascension mean then at that moment? We're going to focus on that today a little bit, okay? Okay. Then second, ask yourself this, what does it mean now? Because listen, I believe that the Bible is relevant, it's applicable for us today. It's not just relevant for what happened hundreds and hundreds of years ago when these things were happening. Listen, I believe that God's word still applies. It still speaks. And I believe God's people ought to run to his word because it applies to today. So the second question we should always ask ourselves from a passage of scripture, even from something like the story of the ascension, is what does mean now and then third we should ask ourselves what does it mean to me personally 
I mean, you want to walk out the doors today different than you were when you came in the doors today? Then you take a story like the ascension that happened after the resurrection, about 40 days after the resurrection. All these amazing things have taken place. He's risen from the dead. And then while the disciples are standing there, they watch him go up into the heaven. And they're probably thinking the same thing you're thinking. What just happened? I mean, we put him in a tomb. He rose from the dead and now he's gone again. What are we supposed to do with that? Now, that was relevant in that day when it happened. And I'm just telling you, it's just as relevant today. We're going to see that this morning. What does it mean for me personally? When I walk out the doors today, what does the ascension mean to me? What's it telling me? What's it, what's it calling me to? Well, let's kind of dig into this just a little bit. And let me get to unpack it before I give you these simple points today. And we kind of get into the heart of the message. Now, l- answer those three questions as we're kind of working through this. Now, if you'll look at our passage of Scripture there in Mark 16, verses 19 and 20, I think this is very interesting. Now, Mark uses the word received up. Notice that. I think that's interesting. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven. That's a very interesting word in the Greek language. It's the word analambano. Literally, it's a compound word in the Greek. Ana means up. Lambano means to carry. He was carried up. That's interesting. He was, he was carried up. So after the crucifixion and the resurrection, the Bible tells us that Jesus was literally physically after 40 days, right, appearing on the earth. After that time, he was physically carried up into the heaven and set down at the right hand of God. That's what verses 19 and 20 say. Now that's an amazing thing in and of itself. And it was witnessed just like the resurrection was witnessed. It was witnessed by his disciples. That, that same word, analambano, is used in Acts 1.8, where we're going to be a little bit later, where, where we read these words. Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was analambano. He was taken up, carried up, and the clouds received him out of their sight. Now, you know, that must have been an amazing amazing thing that happened there. Luke's gospel tells us something very similar in Luke 24, 51. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them. And it literally uses the word carried up and a lambano into heaven. That's amazing. That's what the ascension is. It's the carrying up of Jesus into heaven. Now, now here's what happens with me when I read a passage like that. Those three questions start to ring in my mind. What did it mean? What does it mean now? What does it mean to me personally? God, why does this make a difference in my life? Why is this important? Well, I want to tell you that, listen, it's important because it impacts what we're called to in light of the crucifixion and the resurrection. It tells us what we're to be doing in the meantime. It tells us what the rest of the story is for you and I, right? There's more to the story. The story now gets placed in our hands. What are we going to do with it? And that's a pretty powerful insight, if you think. So when you look at this passage of Scripture, let's go back to verse 19 there in Mark 16, and let's begin to think about it. Here's what it says. So then after the Lord has spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and set down at the right hand of God. Now let me ask you, where is Jesus right now? That's a good question. Where is he? Right? Well, I want to say he lives within me, right? We say as Christians... He's in my heart. I invited him in and he came to live inside of me, right? But but let me tell you something. Spiritually, that's true. When you invite him in, he comes into your heart and your life. He makes a difference in our, and spiritually he lives inside of you. But where is he physically? At the right hand of the throne of God. That's what Mark's gospel tells us. That's what Acts tells us. That's what Luke tells us. The, the, The harmony of the gospel tells us that's where he is. Even right now, he is there. Well, what's he doing there? That's what I want us to answer today. I want us to dig into, and and here it is, listen, y'all know I have a hard time getting through one point, much less two, and three we hardly ever get to, and I'm going to give you four today, all right? So let's see how we do, I heard an uh uh-oh, all right? That person needs to be praying, all right? Be praying today. We're going to give it our best shot. So I want you to think about this. What does the ascension mean to me personally? I mean, I read the story. I hear it repeated in the Gospels. I understand that it was witnessed. You're saying to me that in light of the crucifixion and the resurrection, it is as important, especially for what we're to do in the meantime, as a part of the story's ongoing saga, right? It applies to us as believers. It applies to the church. What is it telling me? What does it mean? Well, jot these things down and get this. The first one, I think, is just a reason for rejoicing 
and worship. So get this first one down. Here it is. I believe the ascension of Jesus reminds us that he went up so that you and I can get in. What do I mean by that? I mean by his going up, he is essentially saying to us, every provision for your salvation and mine has been made. Everything's been done. Everything's complete. We don't have to re-crucify Christ. We don't have to try to be good enough. We don't have to try to be churchy, right? It doesn't matter what denominations beside our name. Everything has been done in the resurrection and the crucifixion for our salvation. And when he went up to heaven, he signified that to us. His work on earth was finished. Complete. (laughs) Done. He went up signifying that if you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you're going to get in one day. Amen? Amen. Praise God for that one. So let's think about this. Let me, let me say this again. The ascension means that the provision for salvation, your salvation and mine, is complete. It's done. Now, here we go. We're going to track back to Mark chapter 16, verse 19 again. You're going to hear that verse a bunch, but look what it says. It says, so then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up to heaven, and he sat down at the right hand of God. There is more packed in that little verse than you can ever imagine. Now, now think about this with me for just a second and get this around your head, okay? When do you sit down after a task or before a task? Well, hopefully you're not sitting through the task, right? But some people do that too. But, but, but generally speaking, when the job is done, you sit down. When your task is complete, you sit down. Now, that's an interesting picture that you're hearing in verse 19 of Mark chapter 16. It says this, so after this, he had spoken these things to him. He told them, listen, go into all nations and tell other people the story. Tell them that I'm alive. Tell them that I died on a cross for them. And then what happened? And he was carried up into heaven and he sat down, signifying to us that his job, his work was finished, that he'd done everything he needed to do. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. I want you to go, listen, I'm not grabbing this out of nowhere, okay? Very biblical concept for us to understand that when Jesus sat down, that means he stopped having to work to purchase your salvation because it was purchased. It was done. When he sat down, his work was finished. And our salvation's complete. And by trusting him, listen, we can know that every provision for our salvation's done. Listen, that's one of the reasons that I don't worry about the doctrine of eternal security and people saying you can lose your salvation and all of that kind of stuff. I want you to understand, listen, Jesus went to a cross once for you, died on that cross once for you, was buried in a tomb once for you, rose from the dead once for you, ascended to heaven once for you, sat down and said, it's done. You don't have to keep doing it. You get it? It's yours. And that's fabulous when you think about it. It ought to cause you and I to worship like we've never worshipped. We ought to jump up and down. We ought to rejoice, understanding that this simple ascension is giving me a message. Jesus sat down because my salvation's complete. I don't have to work for it. I don't have to earn it. That's not what does it. Your, your salvation's done. Well, listen to Hebrews. It says this. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who, speaking of Jesus, being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, he did it. What did he do? He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Folks, listen to me. Stop doubting what Jesus already settled on the cross for you. If you have accepted him as your Lord and Savior, listen, he is sitting at the right hand of God signifying that your salvation is complete. It's done. You belong to him. That's a powerful truth if you think about it. This is pictured all in Scripture. You know, you know, one of the things a lot of people really miss, but in the Old Testament, it was always pointing to the Messiah. It was always pointing to Jesus. And many people don't know this, but the Old Testament tabernacle and even the Old Testament temple was a picture of Jesus. All of it. 
And you say, well, what are you talking about? Well, now, think about it. Everything having to do with that temple was really a picture of Jesus and who he was and, and who he was going to be and what he would do for you and me. And even this is pictured in the temple. Now, now, think about it with me for a second. Jesus was a priest, right? A priest is a go-between between man and God. P- priests represent man to God. Jesus was also a prophet. That represents God speaking to man. He was that too. That's seen in the temple. And of course, he was king, king of kings and lord of lords. Now, now think about what was happening in the tabernacle and then in the temple in the Old Testament. There was a high priest. And every year, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies in the presence of God, and he would make sacrifice once a year. But it had to be repeated every year. Now, you go back and read about the tabernacle in the Old Testament, or go back and read about the temple in the Old Testament, and what you will never find is a chair. You know why? Their work was never done. That's why the blood of bulls and the blood of goats could never satisfy the redemption that was necessary for you. The priest had to do it every year, over and over. Had to go into the Holy of Holies, make atonement for the sins of the people, the high priest, right? Had to do it every single year. He never sat down when he was in the temple or when he was in the tabernacle. There wasn't a chair to sit in because that task was never done. But when Jesus came, he came once for all. Gave his life on the cross, died, was raised for your sin and your salvation, and then he sat down. It's done. The victory's complete. complete. You see it? So, so the ascension is so important, and this is a cause for victory and rejoicing. What we see in that and how it applies to us today is for us to understand that when he went up and sat down, he was signifying that your salvation is secure. All you must do is receive it. Have you received it? Have you accepted Jesus Christ who died on a cross for your sins, rose from the dead, that you might be victorious and one day spend eternity with him in heaven? Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? And listen, that's all you must do is trust your life into his hands and receive him. And it's done. But that's not all the ascension tells us. I love this too, and I find this quite comforting as a believer. And and get this one down, because I think second of all, the ascension also tells us, it reminds us that he went up, that prayers might go up. Okay, so what are you talking about there? I want you to notice this. This is so important in this passage of scripture. That is the ascension is so encouraging and important for us because it means Jesus' prayers for the saints, that's the saved Christians, believers, continue even to this day. He's praying even now at the right hand of God in heaven. This is power. What happens after the resurrection? He comes back to life. He goes and he sits down signifying that salvation is complete and he's ever interceding for us. What does it mean to intercede? I mean, he's talking to God on our behalf. He's, he's speaking on our behalf. He's representing. He's advocating for us. He's constantly. Every time we mess up, guess what we've got? A Savior who paid for our sins, past, present, and future, interceding for you. When we fail, when we fall, when we don't live up to what we're supposed to be, when we backslide, and we do backslide, right? What do we have? A salvation that's complete because he's set down, and a Savior who is constantly interceding for us. It never stops. Even to this day. I love that. I I was thinking about that even as we gather to worship today. In this room this morning, we're all different places. I get that. We are. Some of us are struggling. Maybe spiritually, some of us are struggling with some things that have long had their grip on us. Some of us are only here because someone invited us and maybe really don't want to be here. And I get that. I get that. But here's what I know. I know that you have a Savior right now. A Lord who sits down at the right hand of God and he's got you on his heart and his mind and he's speaking to the Father on your behalf. He's drawing you. He wants to comfort you. He wants to speak to your hurts. He wants to give you victory. If you've never received him, he wants to give you salvation, right? He wants you to give you a hope. He wants to give you a future, a home in heaven. You you get it? He's ever interceding for us. I I, I love what Hebrews 7.25 says. This is this. It says this. Therefore, he also is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives. Since he raised from the dead, he always lives to do what? To make intercession for them. He's alive and he cares about you and he's constantly speaking to the Father on your behalf. I've heard someone say about that verse, Jesus is able to save them from the guttermost to the uttermost. 
That's pretty good and it's pretty true, but it's even more than that. He's interceding for us. The word intercession means, or interceding means to meet with the person for consultation, to pray on behalf of somebody else. I want to tell you that I love knowing, and I know Nancy does too, I love knowing that you guys have been praying for our family and that you've been praying for Nancy. But you know what I love even more? That Jesus prays for her. That Jesus prays for me. That, that he's interceding for me. That's pretty powerful. Theologian Dr. D.A. Carson says Christ's intercessory ministry is most explicitly set forth on the basis of his once for all cross work and his own everlasting resurrection life. Christ lives perpetually to intercede for us. And you say, that sounds pretty deep. Got to get my head around it. Well, before you do that, let me tell you what Max Licato says. He kind of brings it down to earth to me. Max Licato says this, while we wait for Christ's return, we can be encouraged because Jesus is praying for us. Everything changes when Jesus prays for us. The devil may land a punch or two, but he never wins the fight because Jesus is protecting you. Wow. You go, well, well where are you getting that? Isn't that specifically what this passage of scripture tells us? In what we're looking at right now in, our, in God's word in Mark chapter 16 verses 19 and 20. Look, look at it. It simply says this. So, when, so then after the Lord had spoken these things to them, he was received up into heaven. And here it is. He sat down at the right hand of God. You see that? Indicating what? Your salvation's complete. And they went out and they preached everywhere and they told it. Well, what's he doing sitting at the right hand of God? He's interceding for us. That's what we read in the abundance of Scripture. Great Puritan preacher Thomas, uh, Thomas Watson wrote in 1600, he said, When a Christian is weak and can hardly pray for himself, Jesus Christ is praying for him. And he prays three things. And here's the three things that Thomas Watson said he prays for us. He prays that the saints may be kept from sin. I like that. John 17, 15 says, this is Jesus speaking. I pray that thou should keep them from the evil one, right? He prays that we may be kept from sin. And then he prays for people's progress and holiness. He prays that you and I as believers might become more like him, holy. And third, he prays for their glorification, that one day they'll be with them in heaven, joining them there. Remember that. He sat down at the right hand and what is he doing on our behalf all the time? Speaking to the Father about us. That's point number two. Here's number three. What does the ascension mean for me today? Now I'm framing this in kind of an interesting way. I'm saying to you, listen, he went up at the ascension that we might get in, that we might be saved. The ascension didn't save us. Jesus Christ through his cross and his resurrection, we are saved, but it confirms that the work's been done, right? Right? And he also, as he's up there, he is interceding. He's praying for us every single day. He's praying for us. Now look at this third one. The ascension of Jesus also reminds us that he went up so that we might go out. It's just a reminder to us that, listen, Jesus sits at the right hand of the throne of God and he's left us work to do. He's left us homework. He finished his part. Now the rest is up to you. You and I as believers kind of define it this way from time to time. We'll say things like, well, the church is to be his hands and his feet. We are to be his mouthpiece today, sharing the good news, sharing the gospel, telling others about Jesus. Let me just ask you, on a scale of one to two, how well are we doing that today? Really being his mouthpiece. I want to suggest to you that a lot of churches are very content to sit within their four walls and have their comfortable little club right? Because we all agree alike, we all see alike, and we look outside and we look at our world and we go, well, the world is just going to pot. Can I tell you why the world is just going to pot? Because the world is pot, right? It's a sinful fallen world. And what the world needs, listen, Christian, is what you've got. What the world needs is what Jesus Christ did for them on the cross. They need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. So what do we see happening in the passage of Scripture that we're looking at? Let's go back to it. Let's look at Mark chapter 16, verses 19 and 20. Look at it. It says this. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up in them. He sat down at the throne at the right hand of God. And here's what they did. And they went out and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. 
Amen. That's what we see him doing. He went up that they might go out. He went up indicating that their salvation is secured, the work has been done, the task is finished. He's constantly praying for us, and then he sent them out. And if you read the preceding verses there in our passage in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 18, you're going to find him telling them to go and do that. That's exactly what he calls them to. That's what he calls them to go and do. They're to go and tell. They went out and they preached everywhere. One preacher said it like this, somewhere along the way, we have subtly and tragically taken the costly command of Christ to go baptize and teach all nations and muted it into a comfortable call for Christians to come, be baptized and listen in one location. You get it? That's not what we're called to. Of course, we need to gather for worship. Of course, we gather in a church that we might worship and lift up his name. But here's what's supposed to be happening. You're supposed to come in here and get your gas tank filled so that you can drive out into a lost world and give them the hope of Jesus Christ. That's what's supposed to be happening, right? But somewhere we've lost our way with that. Uh, this is the one quote that kind of triggered me into this miniseries. I read a quote this week that someone said, Jesus went up that we might go out. And I got to thinking, you know, that's right. We stop at Easter at the empty tomb knowing he's alive and we never do anything with the fact that he's alive. Listen, that's a message that has to be told. That is not a message that you and I ought to keep to ourselves. To me, it's like, and listen, I'm doing way too many funerals in these days. People dying from cancer, things like that. I hate cancer. If I knew the cure to cancer... And I knew 100% that this one cure would heal them and I kept it to myself. That would be sinister. Sinister, right? What is it for a believer to know Jesus Christ and the hope of the world and not tell anybody? Maybe it's sinister, right? You and I need to think about that. That's what we've been... He went up so that we would go out. And you go, what does the ascension mean to me? It means my salvation secure. I ought to rejoice in that. I ought to jump up and down. I ought to celebrate. That. Matter of fact, I ought to be so excited about that fact that when Jesus sat down and I know he's praying for me and he loves me, he's ever interceding for me, the task is complete. That ought to excite me to the point that it motivates me to go tell somebody else about what he's done for me. You get it? That's powerful. You go, well, Brother Buddy, where are you getting all this stuff? Okay, we're going to move now. Let's go to Acts chapter 1. Flip over with me. This is the other passage we've got to look at. We're going to be back in Acts next week, by the way. But Acts chapter 1, I want you to see this. This is the story in the gospel of, in, 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 in Acts, which is written by the same gospel writer of Luke. Most people believe Luke probably wrote Acts too. Okay, and I want you to look at verses 8 through 11 there with me. Here's the story. This is what happens. Listen close to this because this is what Jesus said to his disciples just before the ascension, beginning in verse 8. Jesus said to them, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my what? Witnesses. That is, you're going to be sent to go tell everyone what's happened. You will be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's almost like concentric circles to those right around you, those just outside of you, those even outside of that circle, and then even to the uttermost parts of the earth, of the world, you will be my witnesses, verse 8. And one verse later, in verse 9, look at it, it says, now when he had spoken these things, as they, while they watched, he was taken up, there it is, and a lombano carried up, and a cloud received him out of sight. Verses 10 and 11 are almost comical to me. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who you saw taken up into the heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Hey, let me buddy eyes it because I love to buddy eyes this verse. They're looking up into heaven. Whoop, there he goes, you know. We just had him raised from the dead. Now he's gone again. They're looking at him and the angels come and stand beside him and say, didn't he just give you an assignment? What are you doing? Standing there looking up into heaven? You got work to do. I think that's what he's saying to his church today. What are we doing gazing into an empty tomb? What are we doing gazing up at the sky waiting for him to come back? We've got work to do. He went up that we might go out. You see it? That we might go tell others about him. And here's the fourth point. You didn't think I was going to make it, did you? 
Whoever that is over here that's praying for me, thanks. You got me there. Here's number four. Thank you. Um, Number four. He went up that he might come back. Did you notice it in the passage we just read in in, in, in the gospel in, in Acts? It says this. Why are you looking up into heaven? This same Jesus that you saw go will in like manner come again. He's coming back. That message starts in the very first chapter of Acts. He's going to return. He's coming back. I love that. Now, verses 9 through 11 of Acts chapter 1, kind of where we're parked right now, it, we kind of keep seeing this theme again. Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was, in a Lombardo, taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, here it is again, he went up, and a Lombardo, second time it's used. Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, and also said, Men of Galilee, Galilee why do you stand gazing up into heaven? What are you doing looking into heaven? He's gone. He's going to come back by one more again. Look at this. The same Jesus who was taken up, and a Lombardo, who was carried from you look at it there right at the end of verse 11 will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven that means a couple of things think about how they saw him going to heaven they saw him literally go into heaven that means he's literally coming back all right they saw him bodily alive after the resurrection and bodily carried up into heaven they are going to see him bodily return one day And notice in that passage of scripture, it says he's coming back for them. He'll come back for you just the way you saw him go. That means he's coming back for us as believers one day. The same way you saw him go, that's the way he's going to come. He's coming again one day for you and I. That's a powerful truth we must never let go of. The ascension could not be more important for us. Every single day, We live in the hope of Jesus Christ and his salvation because he's finished the task. He's set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Every day, I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're going through. I know you covet the prayers of other believers and you covet the prayers of the church and your friends and your family and all those kind of things. But every single day as a believer, listen, I can make it because I have one who ever lives to make intercession for me. And so do you as a believer. I also understand that my work here on earth is not done. And until that day is, he's going to leave me here. And my task is to tell other people about the good news, the hope of Jesus Christ that he brings to our lostness, right? He went up that we might go out. And I also know that this isn't all there is. It's not. That one day he's coming again. And he's going to bring this old fallen world to an end. And he has a place prepared for me and a place prepared for you as a believer. And he will receive us up to himself to be there with him. Listen to this story I read this week and I love this. The story is of a gardener who kept a garden for a very wealthy man who traveled a lot and was rarely home. This gardener spent every single day trimming and grooming every part of that great mansion and its gardens just so it would be perfect for when the master returned to this great mansion. One day, a visitor from town walked through the beautiful garden and said to the gardener, what a beautiful manicured garden. I've never seen anyone, not a blade is out of, out of place. I've never seen anyone keep a garden so beautifully. I've never seen anything like this. Knowing that the owner was constantly out of town, he said, you're keeping this garden as if you're expecting the owner to return tomorrow. The man said, no, sir. I keep this garden as if he were coming today. That's how we ought to live every single day. Listen, if you're here and you're a believer, rejoice in the fact that your salvation is finished, complete, it's done, and he's set down signifying the work's been done. Praise God every day that he is advocating for you, interceding for you. He ever lives to make intercession for you. Praise him for that. Be busy telling those around you, family members, neighbors, work associates, every opportunity that God opens. Be busy telling them that the tomb is empty and he is alive and he wants to live in them. Tell them. And every single day, live like that as if he's coming back today. I would say to you, how well are you keeping your garden? Some of us maybe have let some weeds grow up in some of these areas not being faithful to what he's called us to. Maybe not every single day living in the shadow of the cross, understanding that he came and gave his life, not just for me, but for a whole world that's lost, that's hurting. That I carry the good news and the message for those who need to hear. 
that the answer to the problems that we're facing in our world today is not another government program, not what political party is in office, who's president or who's senator. It's not that. Not a great economic recovery or great reform in our educational system or great reform in our governments. The answer lies in Jesus Christ who gave himself for us. We have the good news. And he's coming again one day. And that's the word of hope that the world needs to hear. That's the ascension. It's what it teaches us. You see, there's truly more to the story for you and I. We're to live every day preparing for that day when he will return as believers in Jesus Christ who carry the hope of the gospel. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? With heads bowed and eyes closed, I, I don't know what God might have said in your heart today. I know just working on this message and, and, and thinking about what the ascension meant for me personally, what it, what it means for me. There's a lot of powerful moments in that for us. It means much in every way. If you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ who died on a cross for your sins and rose from the dead for you, if you've never trusted that, accepted that gift on your behalf, Oh, I cannot plead with you, beg with you enough. If the Holy Spirit is drawing you, say yes to him now. And your salvation will be complete. The hope of heaven and eternal life will be yours. Invite him in right where you sit. Just between you and him. It's a personal relationship. Do that. If you're here today as a believer and you've struggled with this salvation thing, am I really saved? Am I not saved? Am I saved today and not saved tomorrow? Have I done too much? Have I lost my salvation? I want you to understand the ascension is saying to you, it's not up to you. It was up to Jesus and his work is finished. He's set down at the right hand of the throne of God. If you have trusted him, he's yours. Rejoice. Right? And not only that, he's praying for you every day. Every day. Thank you, Lord. Now he wants you to tell somebody about it. It's that sweet. It's that good. And he wants you to be busy about the task he's given you to do in anticipation of his coming. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to just um, pray. I want to lead us in a prayer. And then we're going to worship him. Cry out to him. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. That's it. And then we're going to ask you to respond to him, whatever he's saying in your heart, your life. Maybe right where you're sitting. Maybe here at this altar, it's going to be open. Trey's going to be here. I'm here. We'll pray with you, encourage you. We can't save you. Jesus has already done that. All we can do is point you to him. We're no different than you. But if we can help you somehow, pray with you about that, encourage you, We'll do it. It's up to you what your response will be. I'm just going to tell you, you can walk out of here today different than you walked in, not only because of the cross and the resurrection, but because of the ascension. Right? Rejoicing. Father, we thank you, thank you, praise you for your word. Thank you for the hope that we find in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the promises that are declared even through this event that we sometimes overlook, the ascension of Jesus. I pray today that hearts and lives have been drawn to you. God, I believe your word doesn't go out void and that you're working and speaking in people's lives this morning. So God, we place this in your hands. We ask you to move and draw those who need to come. God, it's not about what church we're sitting in. It's not about who's preaching. It's not about any of those things. We want to step out of the way and let you have your perfect way. So what you do here in this place today in response to what we're hearing, we'll give you and you alone the praise and the glory. It's in your holy, holy name that I ask these things. Amen. Would you stand?